Good morning, everyone. It's good to see your faces, those faces I can see. And I know there are others out there whom I can't see, but I want to just extend a wide and a deep welcome to all of you who are joining us this morning for worship with St. John's Episcopal Church in Johnson City, Tennessee. Uh, a few notes uh, before we begin about our service today and about upcoming events. Uh, yesterday was diocesan convention in, uh, for the Diocese of East Tennessee, and I thank uh, those of you who were delegates, uh, Rebecca Paluzzi and McKenna Cox and Emily Bidgood. Um, our bishop, Bishop Cole, gave a very fine address and encouraged us to share it widely. And I thought it was important to offer it this morning uh, so that as many of you as possible would, would be around to, um, to profit from it. So we are going to be uh, uh, viewing that and hearing that at the time of the sermon. And I invite you at that time, and I'll, I'll remind you beforehand to turn off your video during the bishop's address and that will help um, prevent or alleviate any reception problems that we might otherwise encounter. So just click off your, your video at, at that time. Um, I have um, dropped into the chat this morning also a link to the worship service from Diocesan Convention, which will air this morning at 1030. Uh, if you don't see it today, you can view it some other time on that website, but there is a link in your, in your chat function this morning. Um, and then just a few notes about upcoming events. A week from Wednesday, believe it or not, the season of Lent begins with our uh, celebration of Ash Wednesday. And on the first Sunday of Lent, we will be celebrating Holy Communion again, as we did at Christmas time. So um, the ashes will be blessed ahead of time for Ash Wednesday and the bread and the wine consecrated ahead of time for the first Sunday of Lent. And we will have two times to, for everyone to drive by and pick up uh, the ashes and the bread and the wine at the same time, just one time for, for both days. Um, and one of those will be next Sunday, uh, early afternoon. So. All that information is in your um, your e-newsletter this, this week at St. John's from this week, but I just wanted to give you a heads up about that. Um, but before Lent ever begins, uh, we need to have a party, uh, our Mardi Gras party. And so uh, that will happen on Tuesday evening. It'll be, of course, via Zoom. Um, but we're going to make it as festive as possible and there'll be music and we're inviting everybody this year uh, to, um, um, or we're gonna celebrate everybody this year as kings and queens and princes and princesses. So uh, make a crown for yourself, wear a crown, wear a tiara, uh, put on your best hat, um, whatever you need to do, um, to dress up and join us for just an hour of festivity um, with all our your favorite uh, uh, eat dinner together and make your favorite uh, Mardi Gras dish, red beans and rice or whatever it is that you love to cook. Um, and this Wednesday is our last um, in what has been a marvelous series, uh, listening together uh, in Epiphany with Lee Biggood. And so I invite you to join us for that if you're able at seven o'clock this Wednesday evening. Now I invite you to just take a moment to gather yourself as we join together in prayer on this fifth Sunday after the Epiphany.
Blessed be the one holy and living God. Glory to God forever and ever. be with you and also with you let us pray set us free O God from the bondage of our sins and give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in your son our Savior Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit one God now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Isaiah. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it been not told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in, who bring princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows upon them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name, because he is great in strength, mighty in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, 
O Jacob, and speak, O Israel. My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youth will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, for an obligation is laid on me. But what is me if I do not proclaim the gospel? If I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. Then is my reward this, 
that in my proclamation I may make the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win Jews. The law, I became as one under the law. I myself am not under the law. So I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law. So I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessings. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. After Jesus and his disciples left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, 
so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. And now I invite you to turn off your video as we welcome uh, Bishop Cole into our midst this morning and listen to his address to the diocese from diocesan convention yesterday. Um, he will mention this as well, but I wanted to give you a heads up that his address to the diocese was uh, filmed here at St. John's um, in our centering prayer room. Uh, diocesan convention was supposed to be held at St. John's this year instead of via Zoom. And uh, we will be hosting in 2022. So uh, welcome Bishop Cole. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. He got up and fled for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, get up and eat. He looked and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, get up and eat. Otherwise, the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. At that place, he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, what are you doing here, Elijah? I am speaking to you from St. John's Episcopal Church in Johnson City. To be more specific, I am in the room where the Centering Prayer Group gathers. The first time I entered this space, I was here to lead a weekend retreat on Centering Prayer and Contemplation. It's one of those spaces, as soon as you enter, where you realize people have prayed here for some time. I speak of it as a holy hum. At the conclusion of last year's Diocesan Convention at St. Paul's Church in Chattanooga, we announced that this year's convention in February 2021 would take place in Johnson City. 
While we were eager to travel to the Upper East, we wondered if St. John's Church, Johnson City, would have adequate space to host our gathering. It turns out when you hold a virtual convention that St. John's Johnson City has more than enough space. While you are listening to my address from numerous places across East Tennessee, I knew I still wanted to be here in this sacred space in order to speak with you now. At the conclusion of my address to convention last year, I invited you to go with me on a pilgrimage. It was to be an interior pilgrimage, a pilgrimage of prayer, of paying attention to the interior landscape of our lives. I suggested it was the interior pilgrimage which often requires the most planning and can be the most daunting. As it turns out, I'm glad I did not announce in February 2020 that the Diocese of East Tennessee would take an actual physical pilgrimage, traveling from here to there, staying in one lodging and then another, traveling by bus and plane and ferry and foot. For if I had, that plan would have soon been scuttled. I'm repeating what you already know, but in mid-March 2020, all the plans we thought we had for the year and years to come began to disappear. Calendars once full were empty. We stayed put. Many of us never left the house. We placed the pilgrimage shoes back in the closet. Since last year's convention, while we have stayed put, many things have approached and touched us. We have been touched by illness and death from a modern day plague. For some of us, our eyes were touched and were able to see again that systemic racism and the ideology of white supremacy still has a strong hold on our culture. We were shown that we should never take our form of democratic self-government for granted. We must renew it again and again. And too many people now associate the Christian faith in our country with the heresy of Christian nationalism. In our own diocese, all of us were touched by the prayerful decision to close St. Thomas Episcopal Church, Knoxville. On All Saints Day, we offered prayers and shared the Eucharist there for the last time. Like this room, the nave at St. Thomas is a place deeply shaped by prayer. On All Saints, prayers of grief and gladness, of memory and hope, all were woven together, both through the people present and the spirit that hovered over us. So how did we survive 2020? How did we not only survive, but in many parishes did we actually see more than just enduring, but flourishing? I believe it happened because you all did become pilgrims of the interior. I'm aware that through Zoom and other forms of online tech support, parish members across East Tennessee gathered early and often to pray the daily office, many for the first time. This great gift of Anglican, Anglicanism, the steady cycle of Benedictine prayer and work and study, anchored all of us in a time when Eucharistic feasts were not possible. As someone whose prayer practice is deeply shaped by centering prayer and contemplative silence, I've also recently joined a weekly Zoom centering prayer circle. While we were physically separated from each other, bonds of affection were kept strong through prayer, both personal and communal. I will admit to you that this play gear for me included a crisis point. In April and May, on more than one long walk through our neighborhood, I really struggled with how to be your bishop while we are apart from each other. If you and I are not in the room together, if I'm not traveling to you, then how do we do this work together? It was on one of those walks where I realized we were all now living in a world we already said we believed in. We were living in a world or we were not in control. We confess, we confess that we are not in control. We say we believe that God is in control, guiding us and supporting us. Yet when we were also clearly out of control, it felt more like grief than grace. It felt more like disembodied fear than loving trust in the divine sovereign. So like any preacher who preaches a sermon to others because they need to hear it for themselves, I can say to you that what got me through this year was the renewing of my prayer life. As someone who often speaks of the interior life and its primacy in the Christian life, I had recently spoken of it more than I had traveled through it myself. I would have preferred 2020 without a global pandemic, but the pandemic forced me to re-examine what it is I say I believe and choose again to embody those beliefs 
in my daily life. My primary prayer language is that of centering prayer, a daily practice of sitting in silence for 20 to 25 minutes, reflecting on the name of Christ Jesus. I've come to believe that it is in silent prayer that I truly understand God's grace. In silence, with eyes closed, there is no external work necessary to earn God's favor. There is no external striving that can be measured in order to win the favor of others. In silence, in the deep presence of God, there is only the eternal invitation from God to be one with God, to surrender to being one with God. I do not think myself into that relationship. I do not talk myself into that place. I sit without words, and the one who is the word is in me, and I am hidden in Christ. The Roman Catholic priest and writer, Martin Laird, has said we are built for contemplation. In eternity, we are a people in complete and perfect communion with God. While in this earthly life, the practice of contemplation and holy silence is a means for preparing imperfectly for what will be perfect when we die. We will be fully with God. So in our distracted and chaotic time, why not practice being present to the God who is always present with us now? It is important to say that this is not an either or proposition. It is not a choice between prayer and action, between contemplation and the doing of justice. All that we are called to do and be in the world must be anchored somewhere. For Jesus, his public ministry, his life given for others, always began first by going off by himself to pray, to be recentered in the divine triune communion. Centuries ago, St. John of the Cross wrote, Our greatest need is to be silent before this great God, for the only language God hears is the silent language of love. Again from Martin Laird, silence is an urgent necessity for us. Silence is necessary if we are to hear God speaking in eternal silence. Our own silence is necessary if God is to hear us. As Maggie Ross, Anglican solitary and writer, has said, salvation is about silence. Whatever your ministry is in the life of your parish, layperson, deacon, or priest, young seminarian, or among the wise counsel of the elders, begin by attending to your prayers. Within your prayers, allow for a gracious and growing silence. In an age when we drown in information with more and more words coming towards us in news and opinion, from pundits and politicians, remember how few places we have where silence can truly be heard. Finding those places and going there regularly is a soul-repairing work for all of us. At the beginning of this address, we heard the story of Elijah as he is on the run from Ahab and Jezebel. Elijah is afraid, so he runs. He runs all the way into the wilderness. There, alone, he hopes to die. Instead, an angel tends to him and feeds him. He ate and drank and took a journey of 40 days deeper into wilderness and stopped at a cave. There at the cave, the word of the Lord was known to him. The word of the Lord urged him up a mountain because the Lord was passing by. There was a great wind. There was an earthquake. There was a fire. But the Lord was not in the wind or the earthquake or the fire. Now granted, wind and earthquake and fire are all dramatic actions that grab our attention. According to your understanding of the nature of God, you might have thought that God would surely be in the wind or the quake or the fire. Isn't God always outside of us, large and dramatic and imposing? However, when Elijah stood on the mountain, the wind and the quake and the fire came and went, but the Lord had still not passed by. God passed by in the sheer silence. Where there seemed to be nothing, everything was found. Where there was no sound, Elijah heard his true name. In this past year of the plague, you and I probably had moments where we ran, afraid for our lives, into the wilderness, to the cave, either fearing for or hoping for the end. Instead of the end, the word of the Lord came to us, and because there were so few distractions, because you were mostly in your home, holding a calendar that held nothing, you were able to hear the sheer silence. In that silence, you heard the Holy One. In that silence, upon hearing the Holy One, my prayer is that fear lost its power 
because God's gracious love drew so close to crowd it out. Where do we go from here? My prayer is that we will soon be able to speak of a post-pandemic time. My prayer is that time will include more and more opportunities to stand in front of each other face to face, not having to ask each other to mute or unmute. My prayer is that we will join in song and sing all the verses, even if we hum the parts we do not know. My prayer is that we will keep on doing the work of becoming the beloved community, where we as the church consistently live out all the values and beliefs we confess in our baptismal promises. From now on, I pray we never take for granted our obligation to continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in the prayers. Finally, my prayer is that we will keep saying our prayers, keep protecting the time for prayer, for silence, for contemplation. If we're going to face all the challenges in a post-pandemic age, then we will need to be anchored, to be grounded somewhere. That somewhere is prayer not simply to keep saying our prayers, to keep seeking holy silence. My dream for us is we will become a people known by the maturity of our prayers and the anchor of silence that grounds us, from which we will speak words that do not touch the ground. Canon Matt Stockard, recently retired as the canon to the ordinary in the Diocese of East Carolina, has shared with me a diagram he has crafted, which offers a glimpse of what the Episcopal Church in the 21st century might become. I look forward to sharing this visual image in Canon Stockard's written reflections on his work with our diocesan clergy. Let me simply say now that Canon Stockard has placed two words at the center of his design for the Episcopal Church. Those two words are creativity and innovation. Creativity and innovation. Those are not the first two words many people think of when they think of Episcopalians. Yet Canon Stockard suggests those are the two words we need to claim now. I believe he is right. We are a Christian tradition that speaks of Catholic roots and a reforming spirit. We speak of the ancient church, and we speak of the Holy Spirit moving now and doing a new thing. Therefore, creativity and invitation are not simply business speak. They are theological terms for us. They acknowledge that with God's help, we pledge to live out the Christian life now anchored deep in prayer with words and with space for holy silence, with an abiding belief that the Holy Spirit still works in our midst, we need to nurture creativity and innovation if we hope to offer the good news of Jesus Christ beyond our red doors and our parish halls. If we're going to embody the kind of Episcopal witness that Canon Stockard envisions in this century, then we are going to have to make space for creativity and innovation. We are going to have to keep listening and learning from each other, sharing with each other, clergy colleagues and lay leaders in neighboring parish churches as we practice through trial and error what we believe God is calling us to do next in our time. All of that begins, however, where the Christian life always begins and ends, with prayer, personal, communal, with words and wordlessness, with sheer silence that speaks to us and tells us again we have been made one with God through Christ Jesus. No matter how small the room is that holds you when you pray, when you cease praying with words and allow the word to pray through you, you will find more space. More space, both in you and in the room that holds you and in the world you and I have been called to love because God loved it first. In this room here at St. John's, dedicated to centering prayer, there is room for all of us. Amen. You may turn your video back on if you desire. Together, let us now affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, 
eternally begotten from the God, Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Here too. In the power of the spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Michael, our presiding bishop, Brian, our bishop, Laura, our rector, Kathy, our deacon, for all clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the leaders of the nations and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this community, for every city, town, and village, and for all the people who live within them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For good weather and for abundant harvest for all to share, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. I can't see it. Thank you. For those who travel by land, air, or water, for prisoners and captives, and for all their safety, health, and salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our deliverance from all affliction, strife, and need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick and suffering, especially all on our parish list. We pray for Kitty, for Shirley, Alice, Linda, Steve, John, Ray, David, Tim, the Hexpool plant workers. Evelyn, Ed and Charlene, Carolyn, Jackie and Gary, Becky, Peg, Jennifer, Bob, Eble Ume, Bill, and Karen. We also pray for Veronica and Amanda. For the Umikia family. Girl's niece died. For the people of Myanmar, for Larry, Richard, and Myrtle. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remembering especially Dick Blackwell and all who have gone before us in faith and in communion with St. John, and all the saints, we commit ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our God. To you, O oh Lord. We also pray for the repose of the soul of Shione, Umika, and also remember 
the entire Eumenica family. We offer also our prayers of thanks this morning. And we give thanks, especially for those who celebrate birthdays this week. George Taylor, Frank Ray, Harriet Cohn, and Alicia Benton. Watch over these your children, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall. And in their heart, may the peace which passes all understanding abide all the days of their life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And I invite you to add either aloud or in the chat function, your own prayers of thanksgiving. Give thanks for all the people of St. John's and for our Bishop, Bishop Cole. Give thanks Beauty. for Gary and Jacob. O oh Lord our God, accept these fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O oh lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins to God. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Christ came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. Let this peace be shared among us that we may be dwelt into a dwelling place for God. The peace of Christ be always with you. And also with you. you. Peace. Peace be with you.
as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Together we give thanks. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. May Christ, the Son of God, be manifest in you, that your lives may be a light to the world. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, be to God. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nick, and I'll see everyone at coffee hour if you are able to join us this morning. Thank you, Nick. Welcome.